Some days I check in with my creativity and it is just gone. Why? But mind you, this isn't all the time. There are days when I'm just brimming with ideas and I have the energy to explore them. But then those other times I sit down to plan or to write and it's just, there's just nothing. Nothing. There is nothing in the well. With a head full of seasonal metaphors, I figured that the waxing and waning of my creativity must be cyclical somehow. If I could just puzzle out the pattern, then maybe I could harness it for good. Whether it had to do with where I was in my process or the phase of the moon or my menstrual cycle or the barometric pressure. So like I do, of course, I went Googling for answers. But when I searched for creative cycle, most of what I found had to do with the cycle of going from idea to finished product. And there wasn't a whole lot of information about going from a manic creative machine to a hopeless, uninspired puddle on the floor. Except for one, this one. I traced this really intriguing graphic, which I will come back to later, to a 2021 doctoral thesis by the Finnish children's book illustrator, Laura Valoyervi. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I hope that I am and I will put the name down in the description so you can search for it. I immediately downloaded her thesis and I've spent the last few weeks reading all 300 pages and let me tell you, it was a gold mine. Bella Yeri's thesis was that creative people don't wax and wane in their creativity. They never run out of creativity. That is always there. What they, what we run out of is the resources to be able to access that creativity. And she calls that the cycle of creative resources. Which brings us back to that graphic which caught my attention. This is my version of Dr. Valieri's cycle of creative resources. And when I saw this image, it immediately struck a chord with me because these are the different phases that I go through in the process of creating and more importantly, just in my life as a person who values creation and creativity as a part of my everyday experience. So you can see in my illustration how she divides her cycle into two parts. The left side of the circle is the more negative and difficult emotions and the right side is the more positive and productive emotions. I'm going to go through these a couple at a time, but the first thing that I want to point out is that your mindset in each of these two sides of the circle is in a different place. When you're over on that blue side of the circle, your mental focus is more on past successes and what you've been able to do in the past and the end result of what you're currently working on. When your mental state is in the orange side of the circle, then it's on the present and the process that you're currently in the midst of working through. I'm sure it comes as no surprise, I know it does to me, that mindfulness and being in the moment is the key to being more productive and accessing more of your creative resources. I talk about this all the time and it always comes back to that. It is really hard to remember when you're in the midst of this cycle though. So it helps to have this graphic that reminds you of it and just to be told in different formats over time again and again that mindfulness is where it is at. So I want to go through the different parts of this cycle as Dr. Valieri describes them in her dissertation. And it's important to note that this is a cycle. These 
states of mind you do go through in this order. And you can go either way back and forth around the circle. You can go from a positive state to a more positive state, from a negative state to a more negative state, from a negative state to a positive. You can go any direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, around this circle. So I'm going to start with the blue side of the circle because when I am searching for information about creativity and creative resources, it is usually when I'm in a down state and not doing very well. So these two states immediately spoke to me. This is creative anxiety and creative melancholy. Creative anxiety is when you are actively creating still, but you're feeling pessimistic about it. You may be procrastinating. It may feel intimidating to sit down to work. The work may make you feel drained instead of energized. At the same time, you're struggling with blockages. You feel uninspired and you're not willing to take a lot of risks in your work. That seems like a step too far. The step below creative anxiety is creative melancholy. And that's everything's just a little bit worse than that anxiety stage. Not only are you pessimistic, but you are stagnant. You are not doing a whole lot of work at all. You're just kind of sitting in the same place, maybe repeating the same actions over and over again. You are rarely creating anything, and when you are, you are not enjoying the process at all. When you're in the creative melancholy stage, you are prone to imitation because sometimes that seems like the only way to accomplish anything. And you may not be imitating someone else. You might be looking at other artists' work and trying to do what they do. But you could also just be imitating your own past work, trying to do what works in the past because you can't come up with anything new. And in part, that's because your mind is on your past, your mind is on what success you ha might have in the future, and you are not connected to the present moment. On the other side, the two most positive creative states are creative stability and creative flow. And keep in mind that you're going to be, as a creative, always moving back and forth between these positive and negative states. It's inevitable. Creative stability is where you are feeling active, inspired, optimistic, you understand the creative process and what you are trying to accomplish through it. And when you find a block, when you come up against a block or when you make a mistake, you understand that that's part of the process and it makes it much easier to deal with. You're also able to take some risks in this creative stability space. You're able to try new things and bring that into your work. Creative flow is even a step above creative stability in terms of how much you're accomplishing in your work and enjoying what you're doing. You are active, you are inspired, you are very optimistic about the future of your work, and you're finding it easy to get into that flow state, that state where you're working and you're so involved in what you're doing that time passes almost unnoticed. When you're working, it feels free and playful and expansive. It's an amazing feeling to be in that creative flow space and you are effortlessly taking risks. You're trying new things. You are expanding what you are capable of in your creative work. These two states, creative stability and creative flow, are where you want to be in your work. And you don't always have to be in that higher flow state. If you're in creative stability, you're still feeling great. You're still accomplishing a lot. You are still doing the work. Let's move on to the bottom half of the circle, though. Well, seemingly on opposite ends of the spectrum, these two states are really very closely related. And they are creative depression and creative mania. Creative depression is when you are completely paralyzed, when you are feeling depressed. And I want to point out that Dr. Valieri makes a point to say that creative depression, creative anxiety, etc., these are not the same as 
those mental health diagnoses. These are simply referring to the state that you are in within your creativity. So you could be in a creative depression and not necessarily depressed in your everyday life. But when you are in a creative depression, you're paralyzed, you feel depressed, you might be burnt out, and you cannot create. There is simply no joy in the process for you. And there's no risk-taking at all. Risk-taking is a part of creativity. And so when you aren't able to do that at all, when you are only able to act in a logical and ordered and expected way, that leaves you missing out on a lot of what makes creatives creative. On the other end is the creative mania. Creative mania is when you're hyperactive, when you are so into creation that you are overfishing the pond, when you are using every ounce of resources within you, pouring it into a project at the expense of everything else, including your self-care, your friends, your family, everything around you. And that includes impulsive risk-taking, which is beyond the kind of risk-taking that makes creativity what it is and has moved on into the kind of risk taking that is more likely not to pay off than to pay off. And the reason that I'm showing you these two together is that these two opposite states are very closely related. Creative mania can lead right to creative depression in terms of it causing burnout. When you are overfishing the pond, when you are doing too much, when you are ignoring your self-care, instead of just dropping back into that creative anxiety that you might have been in, if you were in a stable or a flow state, you drop all the way down to creative depression from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. I know that I'm going to keep this illustration of the creative cycle near and dear so that I can really analyze where I am in the cycle and what I can do to move upwards to fall into that creative stability and creative flow section of the chart. In her dissertation, Dr. Valierbi suggests six ways to increase creative resources and to make sure that you do land in that most productive section of the cycle. First of all, she says to identify and accept where you are in the cycle. You have to be aware of your mental state before you can think about changing it. Secondly, she says to consciously explore and use level appropriate strategies to move upwards in the cycle. That may mean being more gentle on yourself if you are in a creative melancholy or a creative depression than if you are simply experiencing creative anxiety or you're in a stable state and wanting to move upwards into flow. The third suggestion she has is focusing on the present and the process rather than the future and the results. And we talked about how the two sides of the circle are separated by that mental focus. That is something that you can be aware of and thinking about. I know it's not the easiest thing, but just knowing where your focus should be can help you stay in the more productive parts of the cycle. Number four is to set challenging but attainable goals. At one point, Valierbi quotes a researcher whose name I am not even going to try to pronounce as showing a model of flow that depicts being in the flow state as a diagonal line between anxiety and boredom. The way that you find that line is by finding a level of work that is difficult for you but not impossible. I have also read that flow is most easily attained when you are working on something that is just about 10% above your current skill level. So that you are challenged by the work, but you are learning and growing and able to accomplish what you set out to accomplish. Number five is to aim to understand and accept the creative process. That is to say, to know that part of the creative process is probably going to be moving between these various states. 
And creative anxiety and even creative melancholy are fairly normal parts of the process. It also helps to understand that creative flow, as desirable of a state as it is, is not really controllable. So when you can be in that creative stability state, maybe moving back and forth from there between the occasional anxiety and the exciting moments of flow, you are really in one of the best spaces your creativity can be in. Finally, recognizing negative self-talk and taking conscious action to control your emotional state. For me, that sometimes means journaling through things when I find that that negative self-talk has reached a tipping point or when I can't really get to the bottom of my emotions. Dr. Valoyevi also suggests sharing your work with a colleague or someone whose opinion that you trust so that you can get honest feedback to understand where you really are in your process and not be caught up in the negatives that your mind is telling you, but seeking an outside perspective that might help balance your thoughts. She did also say that more research needs to be done in identifying what helps and what works to move creatives through the stages of this cycle. And I am really looking forward to knowing this cycle and working through what works for me and what doesn't in the future. I would love to hear in the comments if you have some ideas about what works from you, perhaps for moving from a creative anxiety to stability or moving out of a creative melancholy into a state where you are more productive and can create more and enjoy doing it more. Also, as always, if you enjoyed this video, if you made it this far, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. That really helps me reach more people with this and I would love to have you along for future videos. Until next time, I am wishing you love and joy and all of those good things and I cannot wait to talk to you again. <laughs>